Hello, people. We're going to be doing a review and demonstration of some tools. Uh, there's some knives. This is Beavercraft. Now, when I started carving, uh, I bought almost every kind of tool brand that was out there, as well as a lot of the ones that were no longer uh, companies anymore that had gone underground, used ones. I had a collection of tools that was uh, in the thousands. It got a little obsessive. A little bit after I'd stopped collecting, uh, I remember starting to see Beavercraft. Now, when I was buying tools in the beginning, a lot of tools that are in the stores and online are pieces of trash, right? And it pisses me off because it's a waste of money. And then also when, when new carvers pick up those tools uh, and, and they have an a unenjoyable experience wood carving, they don't pick up again, right? Because it's not fun. They usually blame themselves. So I really don't like that. You know, I usually carve with Deep Wood Ventures for knives. Uh, and, I mean, they're as, as good as they come. He's, uh, you know, in America, and um, his, his knives are like swords, right? Maybe just some of the best handmade tools and probably overall tools in general at the current moment. Beavercraft is, is, a, is a cheaper product, and when I first saw it, I thought that... Um, it was going to be, they weren't going to work, okay? Really, that's what I thought. At the price range and kind of like just looking at how they were made, um, <clears throat> I, hadn't, I hadn't tried them in person. I think I heard one person say they were okay. Um, Flex Cut is kind of the only really uh, quality, cheap option that's available everywhere, um, kind of until Beavercraft came. I've had some carvers over the years talk to me that are in other countries, and they do not have access to regular stuff on the internet. The, the sellers are weird, all this other stuff. So these guys are in the Ukraine. So maybe for uh, cheap reasons, maybe for, uh, you know, uh, location reasons, uh, these this might be good for you. And uh, I've tried them a little bit. Um, they're very different. They're interesting. So let's take a look at the Beavercraft tools. Okay, so I had filmed like an unboxing and trying out these tools, but my thing didn't record. It's kind of stupid. So uh, let me show you what I got mostly. Yeah, I was very surprised by these. I got to tell you, I thought they were going to be kind of trash. So it's a great presentation. Uh, nice little uh, thing here. And this is uh, reinforced over here, which... Very good thinking. So we have like a detailed knife here, um, and you can see the similarity to flex cut, right? The handle shape and everything, like, yeah, uh, whatever. Um, we've got like a palm gouge, uh, very, very impressive. And so some of these things, right, like you can tell where that they save costs on. You know, I don't know if they have epoxy in them at all. If, they, if it does, it's way down there. But it seems they've jammed them in there good enough. With small tools, the, the rules have kind of changed on, on wood carving stuff. In the old days when it was all large mallet tools, you had to have a shoulder all the way around, right? Um, you can see this tool here, right? If you were hitting this with a mallet, right, it, which is way different carving, if you're hitting it with a mallet, there's nothing to stop this from just going through as a nail, right, through the back of the thing and splitting it. Um, Nowadays, a different shape in there with a little bit of epoxy or just a stop. You don't really need as much uh, bolstering, which costs a lot in tool manufacturing. So we have like a, a Mora knife type of thing. This is not, uh, you know, laminated or anything. Um, but I got to say, it's quality steel, uh, very quality. It comes ready to use and, um, you know, they work. I, I don't know if there's much else to say. Uh, any of the shortcomings are, uh, they're pretty minimal. And for the most part, uh, my overall view of these is that they're different. Um, they're all very, they're, they're very different from anything out, that's out on the market uh, and how they feel and how they carve. All right, let's try to carve something for real.
So yeah, a lot of a lot of tools that I would buy when I started, and they're still out there. You'll see them when you go to the in stores in America. The only like functional products that they sell, wood carving tools, are flex cut, and that's not very many stores. I'm not sure what the problem is. A lot of them still have a little like palm gouge looking set that's a piece of trash. You go to a hardware store and they sell the Buck Brothers uh, tools and they're just, they're nothing. It's paint, it's something to paint, stir your paint with. Um, and I remember trying forever. It's, it's hard to understand how, uh, how difficult it is, how tricky to get a quality, uh, I really wish I had a V tool that was larger. But we'll get by. To get, you know, a quality steel, because that's where most of them skimp on money. Because if, if it was, as long as it was like, you know, tool steel, quality tool steel, there's like four of them. You know, there's 01, there's like, I don't know, 1095. I forget what the other ones are. There's not many of them, right? And if you don't, if you use that, you could shape the tool any way you wanted it. And as long as it was heat treated properly, which is also gets screwed up, you could shape it to something you wanted. And that's the idea that most people have. They say, oh, this tool sucks, but if I sharpen it up and shape it, it'll be okay. No, it won't. It won't carve. Uh, carving happens on a, a tiny, uh, unable to see for the human eye, like molecular level, okay? The way cutting works, we have this weird idea of it, of cutting. Um, and I'm not sure if we actually have a, a model for it. But So what's happening is on a very small scale, steel, okay, is the densest material, all right? Relatively speaking, they can be shaped. And so steel, okay, it's it can be so, it's so small, right, that it can fit in between the particles of the wood and spread them all right the molecular structure and so if, when you look at the history of like human stuff like you, you guys have all heard of the bronze age and uh i don't know copper and iron age or whatever and so each time one of these materials was discovered or they figured out how to you know work with it and make it and use it for tools each one of those metals would be able to cut through the last metal. Um, so, wood, you can get through wood with uh, all kinds of materials. Um, you know, like the, I, don't, I forget names and stuff. Okay, but like Samoan uh, and like island type tribes would do like a seashell or a piece of jade on an adze, right? And that you could get that into wood. Now, the, that, the circumstances of that are that the blunt force gets a denser material through the wood. And it's the same, but when you get down to a hand, just hand pressure, and you want it to cut real clean, right, and not tear it, which means it's sneaking through there. It's so small and tight that it's not even disrupting the structure of the wood, right? So to get that to happen on a small scale, you absolutely need steel. <clears throat> and it's better to have it on large scales as well. But we need to be going faster here. OK, we got to get the sides of the nose out. Can you guys see what we're doing? All right, we're gonna get that. Boot bang. Okay, we're gonna cut in like this. So yeah, I'm gonna do a chip carving uh, video, and hopefully it doesn't take too long. Um, because what we're doing right here, where the blade went in, and we imagined that we were cutting out this triangle. That's what chip carving is. I never did a whole lot of chip carving. Uh, I just kind of did it once early on when I was, you know, um, exploring all the different types of wood carving and woodworking. And there was a good video on it, luckily. And um, I forget who the, I think it's like Barton, Wayne Barton, I think is his name. 
Um, and that, it just how he describes it and how what chip carving is, it will completely change the way that you carve and the way that you think about cutting pieces out, especially when you're doing knife only. Okay, can you see what we're guys what we're doing here? We got the face going, right? Do you guys see that? Okay, we're gonna do the the top of the beard. We're gonna do a spirit because that's what happens. I haven't been carving much, y'all. Have you guys? Time to pick it up. It's a really good associative practice, okay? Because um, especially right now, I don't know what's going on with our anxiety and COVID and too much internet, but hand-eye uh, coordination and the experience has like dropped off tremendously. I feel like I'm looking at like a blurry cyclone of ADHD when I do this, but I know from the past that um, carving trains a bunch of the body, mind, and soul to chill out and to work together as one. So, yeah, so these guys don't make a V tool yet. There's a few other things that, like, um, y'all, I thought about making knives and tools a lot. I mean, I made my own knives, right? You guys have probably seen me carve with them. And um, it's, a, it's a very rewarding experience to make your own knives. I would absolutely suggest doing it. But only after you buy some more knives that work. <clears throat> because you're going after a finished product. Uh, and if you don't know what the feel of it, then it's very hard to get. And it's always nice to get new, uh, new tools that are professionally sharpened. And probably by a machine, you know, um, or a machine like person, and it's just like, oh my god, this carves so well. And then when you go back to your sharpening, you're like, okay, now I have a target to get to. For me, it was important in my first few years of carving because sharpening really well never stopped as a learning experience. I, I still had room to grow. Uh, and now that I haven't done it for a while, I maybe have some more. Um, I don't know. I need. I, I could sit down and do it a little bit. Um, it's one of those things that I think you get better with as you get older. But again, it trains your mind uh, and hands, which is like this is what I'm saying. It's associative, as opposed to dissociative, which is watching a movie in the dark which is, uh, you know, a stimulation deprivation, right? While watching uh, some sort of uh, propaganda. And it doesn't matter if it's bad propaganda or good propaganda. It's not reality, right? People don't react the same. It's not, it's not real emotions. It's music and camera movement, which don't really happen in our normal lives. So that makes us dissociated. And the only thing that really replaces it is human interaction. And of course, we're getting worse with that. And being on a international dissociation spree and mania hasn't helped if I can get even weirder uh, what's happening to us as a people as a whole this is it was a it's been kind of studied before uh, on, a, on an individual basis there was somewhat of a psychological profile coming out <clears throat> and it actually happened with Japanimation um, there was uh, these guys, you know, kids are outcasts. So, okay, I'm like 40, all right? And I'm single, ladies. I'm just kidding. Um, but I'm, I'm not. What was I saying? I'm 40. When I was a teenager, watching anime was weird, right? Um, and you had to be ashamed of it. Uh, also, like, Dungeons and Dragons was weird and dragon stuff. But things done changed people. 
things done change. Now, uh, so what happened back then, because media was extremely important back in the day. It could give you an entire other world to escape to and a persona to inhabit to get away from your small town and your, your family life. So anyway, these kids would watch, they'd be social rejects for whatever reason, and maybe it was self-rejection. Um, they'd watch a bunch of anime, right? And they'd start turning Japanese, but not really. Um, anyway, there was a, a, a large number of, of these guys were uh, basically shooters. They were school shooters, and uh, or in in situations that were similar to that. Okay, they were they were snapping, and uh, they were basically trench coat mafia guys. And now you'll notice that kids these days, uh, like all of them, watch anime, and they're like you know uh, non-binary trench coat mafia looking kids, um, like exactly looking just like them, right? Um, talking about some real dark stuff anyway so this is um this is a 12 this is like a veneer a veneer uh, i don't know if you guys can see that and it's very small and it's a little bit um trying to do a cross grain drawing with it it's a little bit rough on it a lot of v tools wouldn't get through that either yeah so i mean there are some boundaries to these these tools, I mean, for the price, so oh, you can't really complain. With wood carving tools, like they either work or they don't. It's there's no in between. There's some that are like, oh, you know, like even the quality stuff. It's like, well, it's different, you know, like with the flex cut. Uh, the flex cut, it's like, well, it flexes, you know. These do not flex. They flex a tiny bit. All tools should because they're made out of, you know, quality steel which is spring steel. Before I get back to the trench coat mafia, let me get into steel. So when the steel age came around, it was a huge thing in military because it would spring. Um, we think of hardness as like, you know, a zero to 10 or black and white scale, but it's really not. Um, if things are too hard, like bones, they are brittle, they shatter. Uh, things need to bend uh, a little bit for them to uh, survive uh, jarring experiences, I guess. And so, basically, when th this is in the time of swords, okay? There's knights and dragons and mermaids. I don't know about all that. They were fighting with swords, okay? So when they were using iron swords, um, an I the iron would go into... Uh, a shield, okay, when they're on the battlefield, and the shields are often made of basswood, all right, uh, because basswood is light enough that you can actually carry a shield full of it, and it's pretty strong on a large scale. Anyway, so the iron swords would go in to these wooden shields at a, at a very high, you know, they're trying to kill each other. It's like a football game type of clashing, and those swords would bend, and it would stay bent, and then you can't use a sword that's all crooked, right? And it's time for a, <clears throat> an ED commercial, erectile dysfunction. And the guys would have a knife that'd be like, you know? So when steel came out, it's springy. And so when they would go in on a hard hit and it would hit the, the shield, it would just go, it would deform and then snap right back. And then that guy would go back to cutting people's heads off and all them good things you understand so let's go back to the trench coat mafia so basically these kids were rejects they were not in society enough not socializing and they were hiding off and watching a bunch of anime right and anime is made by dissociated dissociated people and their shooters man a whole other level they usually don't use guns. They use samurai swords. There's like an eight-year-old kid that cut off another kid's head, and he put the head on a pike in the front of the school, and he's like, this is what your system did to me. He wrote a note. I'm like, yo, that is so cold. What world are we living in? <clears throat> anyway, 
So they get dissociated and they start thinking a bunch of crazy stuff. And that it's okay for what happens on the screen, you know, to happen in real life. We also know this from desensitization from watching porno. Uh, many women suffer from this. They treat men like meat, meat puppets. Um, so yeah, that's happening to everybody. I don't know if you guys noticed, but in the last 10 years, this is where we are, okay? Um, we didn't, there was used to not be binge watching, okay? There was no such thing. You didn't do that. Um, now that's normal, okay? It's normal to be, and it was like, what else were we going to do, right? Netflix, it's been so wonderful, right? Remember when the shows started coming out and they started being like movies? And instead of watching a, a short episode, you know, uh, like Dexter came out and the movie, uh, the show about, I don't know. They had like a, a burial thing in their home, Dead Like Me right um, that was when it really started to change and then there was that weed show and then Game of Thrones came out y'all and we got all excited about it didn't we and, and it's like a good thing or whatever but it's not um, who wrote the infinite jest that guy was like, we're not going to survive if we're only watching TV and not hanging out with each other. And he killed himself. Um, he was a TV addict. Anyway, so uh, it'll be interesting to see. I, you know, as a people, I feel like we've been all over the place. Uh, like already dissociated in the things that we think. We've had to be, right? For us to believe and imagine that we're good people and have all these hopes and dreams about, you know, all this, this is tearing out the wood pretty bad. I may be damaged it, I'm not sure. Uh, we may have run into a problem, Houston. I don't really want to deal with it right now. Oh, I have to. With really fine tools, with really thin metal, um, things can go bad. I'm giving it a test. It's springy. It's got a... It means the heat treat's stuck. It's no big deal if that doesn't work that great. I don't have a thing small enough for that. Anyway, so as a people, right, like I think we've been pretty dissociated. It's been time for humans to dream. Um, life has been about pretty much nothing but survival. And then as we've evolved and become more successful, we've had more time to, uh, to dream and think about what we want to do here, right? Um, what kind of lives we want to lead and and we've gotten to a point where we're successful enough as a species that we've overcome our natural balance uh, the things that used to keep us in check we've overcome them because we have intelligence and we have a relative free will now We've been crazy, right? And we've been misled. We don't know how to work with each other. We kind of act like we are self-organizing. It's as, as if it happens naturally. And it's somewhat true, but it's somewhat not. With our intelligence, if we're going to continue to have that and you know some free will, we have to be our own balance, right? And we've been saying a lot of stuff. We think we're really good people. And I think there's going to be kind of a reckoning where we're like, are we really going to do this? Or are we going to stay in la-la land? And this whole dissociation thing, hopefully it's good, right? Because we already did witch hunting, you know? We've already done this crazy, there's a terrorist over here and all this stuff. 
So now that we're really dissociated, maybe we can come back home. Maybe we can say, you know what? I think the world's falling apart. I think that our products are made by people worse than slaves. You know, what do we actually do about the material problem of we can't, we have no system to keep our population in check. We have enough technology that we could all be living uh, like we're in the Garden of Eden. And I mean heaven on earth. And we would have time and energy enough to figure out our emotional and psychological boundaries of what's good in life and where we want to go for the rest of eternity or as long as we can get this world to last. So we have nothing to stop us, right? We need, we need an awareness. And we barely have one as people. We mostly just kind of have a dreaming mechanism that can somewhat affect its environment in order to change itself. Will we get to that next stage? God, I mean, what a life we have here. What a world it could be, you know? And look at what we're doing now. I mean, it's like... It's like we're stupid, right? It's, but it's also like we obviously can't see what's going on around us, like at all. So what would we do, you know? We're not willing to look at uh, how things, some things actually work, right? Like that, I think that maybe there's a material wealth, right, thing that like needs to be distributed as well as power. How do we govern ourselves? I think that, you know, one answer is that it does still need to be somewhat self-governed, meaning that the rules and how things are affected should be in the individuals, that how they live life, right, by a, a, a certain code or whatever and traditions does enough to keep population in check and to keep, you know, uh, a, a quality of ease of life as opposed to a bunch of stress and confusion. And, I mean, things have gotten weird, too. In order to become ourselves, to be able to dream, we needed time. Uh, and we had no idea what we were doing, like, as far as raising kids. This is another thing. Like, we are, we have stopped programming people. And... Man, there's so many reasons that people seem to point out of why things are falling apart. And I think that pretty much everything needs to be attacked at once, right? And it doesn't really need to be uh, large top-down government stuff. You know, uh, treating the earth with respect isn't that difficult, right? Except... We, we have too many people, right? It's like one of the main recurring problems in actually solving all this stuff. And yes, it's being driven somewhat by uh, a, a old power system which has manifested itself in capitalism. Um, because basically the way that you get more power, like if you're a king or queen or, you know, whatever, a top person, or you want to be, you need more people, okay? And basically, this is an issue of time, right? Um, like, if we had a very, like, when there was less amount of people, like, if you wanted to be a king all day, right, or whatever, you wanted to do not work all day, you need enough people to work, right, so that you, you don't. And then if you want fancy things, you need enough people to work, to give those people food so they can make fancy things, right? So we can do extra stuff. Now, part of this is affected by technology, right? Like how much time it takes uh, for things to be made, for food to be made, which is like the main deal. And it seems simple to me, but 
you know, I don't know what really needs to happen. Could the whole world actually come to some sort of similar agreement? Is there going to be like some sort of war? Um, and maybe not like a traditional war, but like, you know, I would say that a future Earth is absolutely worth living, fighting, and dying for, right? Because I've had a good enough life at times to be like, yo, this place could be, if we actually tried, this place could be freaking crazy, right? And however much I complain about my life, it's not as bad, it's not the rough life as some people have had in the past. The people that made it through to give us this opportunity, right? And we don't even have to go to grandparents and great-grandparents. We can talk about humans surviving through enormous stupidity and confusion through uh, very long winters, the ice ages. I mean, miserable existences just being carried on uh, through will of life to survive. And now survival is not just a thing, right? Like it's, we've kind of beat it to some extent. And we either become like, because there's adults, right? They're like, you know what? We're not going to live by the moment. We're going to plan a little bit. We're not going to spend all of our resources. We're going to, we're going to make a, a, you know, we're going to figure it out. And so we have a serious resource problem. And then, but, so past this, we have a, a spiritual issue, right? It's psychological, emotional, and spiritual issue as far as, you know, how we're going to deal with life. How are we going to look at it? Uh, and all of this is balanced by we're all selfish people right and we have it good and because we've all competed against each other you know if, if we let up for a moment we can end up being homeless and we're extremely vain and we can't stop the rat race and it really wouldn't take much right so like you know I think we assume that a really bad thing would have to happen for us to you know, kind of have a come to whatever. Problem is humans are good at controlling things. We've had numerous uh, horrible things happen and we haven't done anything um, because it's out of sight, out of mind, and because we are on a trip that's giving us a high and we're maybe running out, right? the whole success thing you know uh, people have to, we have addictions to a few things people talk about oil and I don't know who was talking about it I'm talking about well, the oil addiction and the way that we were acting like just like a crackhead would start to get violent and immoral and all would get that I mean Cars are a huge problem. Would you guys sit in a garage with your car running? What about with the pedal pushed down at about 3,000, 4, 5,000 RPMs? How long would you stay in your garage for? How long would you stay in your garage for? Okay, well, so now that you've answered that in your head, where do you think all of that goes? Does it go away into a magical space? Is the planet finite? Are we actually in a bubble? Are we in a dome? We're in a spherical bubble, that's right pretty much a we're in a vacuum 
Whatever we put in the air does not disappear. Whenever we put trash in the ground, it does not disappear. The oil that we're taking out of the earth, which is also its absorbency, it's the shock absorber and the cooling system. Just like in cars, we use oil to cool down those parts and lubricate them. We've taken all that out so that our top plates are extremely fragile and they're like crystallized like we took all the marrow out of the bones right the sea has so much stuff in it it might actually start to boil as many of those chemicals change the boiling point y'all what's weird is as someone who studies science and also history uh, and also some of the theological things I think end times could be, like a lot of them, I think they're maybe not metaphors. It's kind of weird. And like, who cares about all of like the scary nightmares, right? Like, we're actually getting there. How, how many more people, like what's the population need to be like? How stressed out do we need to be about making rent, you know? Yeah, we're, we've been putting so much like uh, stuff into the earth or into the atmosphere. So there was lead in gasoline for a long time. You know how at gas stations it says leaded and unleaded? Okay, so do you know how like people make jokes about, oh, this toy or paint has lead in it? Oh my God, how horrible. So we combusted uh, a ton of that into the atmosphere over like maybe eight or nine decades. No big deal. This stuff could actually be traced how much it was and when it was coming down. And it started to come down. All this lead and crap started to come down a little before I was born. It's basically pretty much the millennials. It causes learning disabilities, all kinds of stuff that pretty much has been flooding. And I've heard a lot of stories where people are like, this is what's going on. We've forgotten about this. We've disrespected this. We've poisoned that. And this is what happened. Who cares, you know, what, what is actually the story? Why the hell do we continue to poison the environment that is constantly creating us? The Earth is not our creator. It is a symbiotic relationship. We are made out of the material of the Earth, and we breathe the Earth's breath every moment. It's not a, I was born a long time ago and this is me. It's like we're the same thing. And maybe it's time for a change. I think what we need before things get too bad is a good plan where we're happy. Because we're not, no sane person is going to give up uh, a, a cushy material life right so there needs to be a trade-off like we need to be like okay we're gonna have to give up this stuff but we're gonna have eight hours a day of leisure you know uh, we're gonna have a bunch of the people that used to be you know um, completely focused on destroying the atmosphere and making money we're gonna have them working on uh, leisure time right because we got a ton of smart people We've got a ton of technology that can lead people to suicide, which also means it can lead them out of it. And if that path is traced, we can pretty much get an idea for what makes people the happiest, which is going to be good relationships, quality associations, uh, freedom of mind, education and thought, as well as emotion, and of course, new experiences. We can design all of this stuff if we stop for a little bit. Or a bunch of us. Or just any of us. Say, you know what? Let's make this place better. Because everybody's caught up in their BS about how bad their life is. And you gotta call your own BS. Sure, you gotta get through, you gotta comfort yourself gotta appreciate your losses but at a certain point you gotta pull up britches
my mind needs to rewire. Did you guys enjoy that? I hope you did. Beavercraft. Pretty good rating. 7.5 out of 10. This, sir, will cut.